Hello, thank you for joining us uh, while we answer some frequently asked questions for Jacob Wetterling Resource Center, a program of zero abuse project. I'm Abby, I go by she, her pronouns, and I'm the community engagement coordinator for JWRC. And you'll see on your screen here, we have some of the other JWRC staff members who are gonna introduce themselves. Hi there, I'm Allison Fay. I serve as the director of Jacob Wetterling Resource Center. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm glad that you're here with us today. Hi, I'm Jane uh, Straub. I'm a victim assistance specialist and a trainer with Jake Wetterling Resource Center and Zero Abuse Project. Hello, my name is Kaylee Lund. I use they, them pronouns, and I'm a victim assistance specialist at JWRC. All right, so now our plan is to answer some of the questions that were asked a lot um, or questions that were submitted to us in this past week. Uh, so first up, we have a question that comes from Mike on Facebook, and that question is, when educators and staff are not interacting with their students every day in the classroom, how can they still keep a watchful eye out for potential child abuse in the home? How can they support their students without the in-person learning setting? Thank you. So thank you, Mike. That is a great question. Um, and I think we're gonna be able to help you out with an answer here. It is a question that a lot of frontline professionals are asking themselves right now. We know that um, child abuse happens when kids are feeling isolated and in families that are overwhelmed. And right now this is a time of overwhelmed isolation. We also know that our calls into hotlines are declining because the very people who usually can keep an eye on warning signs and call in don't have that same access. Um, our team actually recently authored a article for 25 tips uh, for, for, for frontline professionals on issues related to child abuse, and this is the first one um, that was tackled in that. If you're looking for that, you can go to zeroabuseproject.org or our Facebook page, Jacob Wetterling Resource Center. Zero, if you you know if you want to look at those 25, but the first one addresses that very question. And some of the suggestions in there are doing making sure to do some web-based check-ins whenever possible, so that you can see faces, have a sense of what's happening, um, letting young people uh, have a chance to check in with you in addition to schoolwork. Just how things are going to the best way that um, just those social emotional learning as well. Um, and keep an eye for kids who have sudden behavior shifts and sudden behavior changes. We know that there are a lot of kids who are having behavior shifts and behavior changes right now who aren't necessarily at risk for abuse, but are just responding to the world that's around them. But knowing that that's happening, those kids may be needing extra support other, in other ways as well. So paying attention to those mood shifts um, whenever possible, having that face-to-face -face and seeking out resources that we have online for caring professionals just like yourself. Thank you, Allison. Um, so next, we are going to turn to some other frequently asked questions that we hear a lot as staff uh, and try to answer some of those for you. So first up, we're going to chat with victim assistance specialist Kaylee and ask a question that we do hear a lot, which is, how can I support a friend who shares that they experience sexual violence? Yeah, so this is a really common question, I think, for people of all ages, but especially people who are in school of some sort. Maybe it's the first time they're experiencing someone disclosing something to them like this. Maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a friend. Um, but if someone shares with you that they experienced something really, um, you know, uh, traumatic or maybe experienced sexual violence, um, you know, I hope that you can kind of take a moment, take a beat. You have, you know, there's probably lots of thoughts going through your head. So just remember that this person trusts you um, enough to tell you this really, you know, hard thing. So I think the easiest thing that you can say is just, you know, oh, that sounds awful. I'm just, I'm, thank you for telling me. I, I, I believe that this happened to you. I, I believe you. Um, your role as their friend is not to ask why questions. It's not to try to investigate or try to seek justice. They just want somebody to talk to. And I think that that's a really important thing to keep in mind as somebody's sharing this, especially if you're not exactly sure what to say. And that's okay to not know what to say. Um, I actually created a 20, 30 minute webinar all about how to be able to support a friend who has experienced sexual violence. And it talks about, you know, some different ways to have conversations, how to check in with follow up, um, how to talk about some of the different options around reporting or medical and mental health care afterwards. And also how to practice self care for yourself, because this might bring up triggers for you. And, you know, if it doesn't, it's still a really hard topic to talk about. So making sure that your friend is getting the care they need and also ways to care for yourself. And that's up on our YouTube channel. Yeah, thank you, that's so important. Um, so our second question for Kaylee has to do with healthy relationships. 
And that is, what are some red flags and green flags in relationships or signs that they might be unhealthy or healthy? Yes, um, so I uh, train on healthy relationships in middle and high school, so um, I have a longer presentation about this, but some of the things that I think is nice to think about when thinking about relationships is you're in relationships all the time, you're in relation with people at all times, so you have friendships, you have romantic relationships, you have relationships with parents and your community, and um, I think that's helpful to think about not just romantic or sexual relationships where there might be red flags or signs of unhealthy behavior or green flags where there might be signs of healthy behavior. Um, but just kind of thinking hol holistically about that. So some common red flags that I think are come to mind right away are, and I'm looking at my notes here so I don't forget any, um, but just not having your thoughts or wishes or boundaries respected. I think that's a big thing where even if it's small, maybe, you know, you wanted um, to have some alone time and maybe your partner is, you know, intruding on you and not valuing that, you know, the request for alone time, that can be a red flag. Um, maybe somebody who says things like, it didn't happen like that at all, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, we call that gaslighting, when someone tries to change the memory in your head of what happened and tries to devalidate what happened. And um, that's not a sign of a healthy uh, relationship. Um, perhaps there's a persistent desire to see your phone or kind of like, check what you're up to or maybe check in with the people that you spend time with. Um, you know, someone that does trust and value you isn't going to be worried about those sort of things. So I think that's something to, you know, stay curious about and just check in with yourself about how that makes you feel. Um, some things like enforcing traditional gender roles without conversations or not viewing you as an equal, that can be a big red flag. Um, and I think the last one that I'll talk about, because there can be a lot of red flags, but um, it's just someone who makes you feel like you're the only one, whether that's they are the only person you have in your life that you can talk to, that you can trust, that you can support, or they're telling you that you are the only one they have. So you have to, um, you know, be that person's support person, be that person's best friend, be that person's partner and their therapist, you know. We, the healthy relationships typically have a lot more balance in them, where there's lots of people you can talk to about different stuff. So. Um, you know, typically in a healthy relationship, we don't see one person being everything for that other person. That doesn't mean they're not the one for you, but it, it's a healthy way of, or a helpful way of looking at that. Um, green flags are a lot more fun to talk about, and there's lots that you can view, but essentially green flags are things that make you want to lean into a relationship or, you know, be more excited about it, kind of take that leap if it feels right to you. These are going to look different from everybody. Some that I think are pretty common are open communication, someone who's excited to um, talk with you about their day, ask you questions, um, uses I statements if you're, you know, um, in an argument, not somebody who um, lashes out or says hurtful things. Um, certainly hurtful things can happen um, or can be said, but someone who also knows that they, um, or someone who apologizes if they've done wrong and can recognize when they've done wrong and when to apologize. Um, someone who views you as an equal, someone who's excited to introduce you to people in their life that are important. Someone who's not, you know, ashamed of you or trying to hide you or keep you a secret, not typically a sign of a healthy relationship. Um, someone who supports your interests, your passions, your personal growth and somebody who makes you feel safe, somebody who doesn't, you know, make your stomach turn if they're angry, someone who, you know, you get happy butterflies when you think about them, not nervous butterflies. Yeah, well, thank you. That's such good information for us. Um, so next, we wanted to talk to victim assistant specialist and senior trainer, Jane, um, to answer some frequently asked questions that she hears about the stress response system and helping children regulate. So our first question for Jane um, is, sometimes my child is very stressed out and it seems that they have a very big reaction to what seems like a very small problem. What can sure. I do? And I, this is not just children, right? This could be adults that we have in our life. Like, what is going on? So I think the really interesting thing is, as humans understanding our stress response system and being able to teach that to children as well, so our stress response system is really a, it's a lifesaver, it's our survival. Our amygdala serves as our internal smoke detector, so it's like our, you know, danger, Will, Robinson, it's always trying to figure out if either I'm safe or if I'm in danger. It's very primitive, um, but when we're stressed out, sometimes what happens is that signal, we have some faulty signals, or we may be tired, we may be stressed out, we may be angry, we may be all living together and not able to go outside for a long time. 
And so what happens is we may have bigger reactions than normal. So a wonderful tool that I like to use is from a wonderful person, Dan Siegel, who's a child development expert, and he uses this brain model. And this is really important to explain to kids. So he talks about, this is your brain, this is your spinal cord, this is your brain stem. Your brain stem does so many things that we don't even think about. Our breathing, our respiratory, central nervous systems, everything our brain does that we don't think about. This right here is our amygdala and hippocampus, which serve as our limbic system. This is our emotions and our memory, and also that smoke detector. And then this is our prefrontal cortex, which is our thinking brain, executive function, planning, decision-making, delayed gratification. This keeps us in control. So what happens when we are stressed out or we're angry or we're mad, that engages the limbic system. So think of what happens if suddenly you're afraid or you're angry or someone does something that you don't like, we become emotional about that. And if I don't control my emotions, what happens is I flip my lid and I'm having a reaction that may seem too big for the situation. And think of a time that we've flipped out. Like we have all done it, right? We have said something we wish we hadn't said. We had had a reaction that's bigger than what, what needs to be. And so in this time with kids, having them understand that's what their brain is doing and that's what their body is doing helps them to slow down and identify when they get triggered, identify when they feel stressed. The key to this is you can't do it right here when they flipped. <laughs> so you need to help them calm down, wait a little bit. And then when your child is calm, having a, a topic about emotions, let's talk to what, about what makes you sad. What are you afraid of? What makes you happy? And the interesting thing is um, when I go in and teach you know, kindergarten and first graders, I will say, you know, what makes you happy? And the kids are like, oh, what makes you sad? And they become sad. And then I'll ask, what makes you angry? And I get it like a blank stare. And then maybe one child will say, oh, that's bad to be angry. So we have this idea that it's not okay to be angry. And anger is a naturally occurring emotion. It's not okay to flip your lid when you're angry. It's not okay to hit your brother when you're angry, right? The reactions are what we have. So teaching kids about their emotions and teaching them to recognize this. What does it feel like when you're angry? Oh, my cheeks get really red. I start to feel hot. We want kids to identify this and then we want them to engage their prefrontal cortex. And until they can do that, as the adults and caregivers, we're going to help them engage it, right? We're going to ask them to breathe or to go um, take a walk or to get up. The other thing that's really important to keep in mind is for some kids, when they're on edge, they need to get the energy out. So it may be they need to, you know, bounce around. For some kids, when they're on edge, they need to go to a nice, safe, quiet place. And so having that talk with your kid too about where do you feel comfortable? Do you want to get it out or do you want to go sit and be quiet? And then we're going to reinforce every time our child says, I feel frustrated. I feel angry. And they're able to control that and make really good choices. Yeah. Those conversations are so important. Um, the second question that we have for you uh, is you hear it all the time. People always say, children are resilient. What does that really mean? Yeah, you know, I think it's one of those things as preservation and especially in the work that we do with children being harmed, you know, children are resilient. We know that bad things can happen. And as adults, we can move forward. Children also can, but they're not resilient on their own. So again, we need caregivers to teach kids that something bad can happen, but we can move through it. And as an adult, I can help you navigate it. I, I think the problem I have with resilience is people always say, oh, you know, you just bounce back. 
And it's not so much bouncing back, but it's, I may just keep bouncing <laughs> or I'm at least going to keep moving forward. Resilience is being flexible and adaptable, right? Resilience is I have a plan A, but if plan A doesn't work, I also have a plan B, C, and D. Resilience is this idea of um, I'm going to problem solve, right? If, if I have a problem, I'm going to reach out for support and I'm going to figure out how to fix it. We don't want a child to feel like they have a problem and it's ever, ever, ever too big for them to overcome. And so as adults, we're going to teach them we may have problems, but we can move forward and we can try to fix things and we can make things better. We don't have to stay stuck here where it is. But it's like a muscle and we need to really use it and practice it. Yeah, thank you, Jane. Um, so finally, we are going to turn to JWRC Director Allison, who can help answer some frequently asked questions about body safety. Um, so our first question is probably the question that I have heard the most um, from folks at safety fairs or schools, which is at what age should our family start talking about body safety? Yes, that's the answer. Yes. <laughs> um, kids, all kids should have information about bodies. And yes, you're going to talk to three year olds in very different ways than you're going to talk to 14 year olds. Um, but our website has age appropriate um, things that kids should know at different ages, but it starts very young. I mean, even diapering infants and toddlers, you know, talking about naming body parts and, and teaching kids about body autonomy, you know, and some of those just, you know, I find myself with, with a toddler, you know, be gentle with the dog, be gentle with the dog, don't pull the dog's tail, be gentle with the dog. That's talking early about consent, that's talking early about um, safety in the sense of just, so uh, sometimes parents feel like it has to be this big, huge, formal conversation at a certain age, but it's something that we roll out as we go, and one good tool to do that is just with what-if scenarios. Um, as kids are able to when they're, you know, four, five, six, the what ifs kind of have to be right in that moment. Like, what if right now we get separated? What's our safety plan? And as kids get older, they can be thinking, um, you know, what if you go to someone's house for a sleepover and it starts to feel really uncomfortable? And they can start to imagine different scenarios. And having those what ifs with us being able to reinforce with kids, you know, we would want to know if there's a problem where you're feeling unsafe. We wouldn't be mad at you. It's not your fault. That can help encourage those conversations at every age. So, um, we can start very, very, very young, um, even before we know what they're retaining, um, and and keep building those connections and, and those skills when it comes to empathy, you know, when it comes to learning about bodies and consent. Great. Um, so our second question is, and you touched on it a little bit in that answer, um, is about body autonomy. Um, Two, which is how do we get um, maybe people with like generational differences, like maybe even cultural differences. How do we get people on board with body autonomy? So we're not forcing kids to give hugs or kisses or things of that nature. Yeah. So I do the teachable safety skills class for parents at ECFDs quite a bit. And that's the number one question after the class is like, I understand it's important to teach my child that they have a right to wave or fist bump or hug or kiss and make decisions about how they greet people and start to learn about their bodies. But my great uncle doesn't have that belief or my, um, my partner's parents don't share that belief and, and how can I get them on board? And sometimes it is like, have you read this book? <laughs> so for some people, you know, helping encourage with, you know, with books, with resources, sending an article of like, oh, I just learned this or making me the bad guy. I'm totally cool with that. Like, oh, we had a speaker tonight at ACFD and they said this was really important. What do you think? Like, totally cool with that. But what I've found to be the most effective just in my own, in, in my own experience of talking to families is grandparents and other people important in that child's life to get them on board of champions of this in the sense of, you know what, my four-year-old loves you so much um, and I'm really trying to teach them right now that they get to make choices about their body. And so if you can really help me focus on the fact it's gonna be rough for a few weeks while I figure this out of fist bumps or high five, I'm gonna give them a lot of different choices on how to greet you. And if you as grandma are totally cool with that and respect that and are able to honor that, and if someone swoops in and says, no, you need to sit on my lap. No, you need to hug me. No, you need to kiss me. Um, their red flag is going to go up earlier because even grandma, who I know and love, and I'm so comfortable with and love so much, respects that, 
those decisions and this person doesn't, I should probably check in with someone who does know the safety rules. We as the people who create the safety net for our kids build the norm. And so if we have adults who are loving um, and appropriately showing attention and affection for our kids, and then someone swoops in with those isolating behaviors, if that child is getting healthy attention and affection from folks, their red flag is gonna go up earlier than someone who isn't getting that healthy attention and affection, we're just really just wanting to be seen. And so um, having our grandparents and, and other family members be champions of this in the sense of we need you to really help with this because if they can set these boundaries with you who they are super comfortable around and who love so much, then it's gonna be easier for them to set boundaries with other people who may not have the same intentions. And so um, the more that we can get grandparents to champion uh, body autonomy, the better off the kids are. And I always, always offer the parents after the class, you know, feel free to have them call our hotline if they have questions about it. I'd love to talk them through just why this is important in a one-to-one -one way. And, and I, I keep those, um, if anyone does want to reach out uh, with questions like this, to, you know, 1-800-325-HOPE or sending an email on our web form at jwrc.org, do know that that members of our staff would love to, to reach back and help with problem solving or help with safety planning because sometimes it's like when you're done speaking at a school or a PTA or faith community you have a line of like eight parents because each one wants that individual answer and we are love to be involved for those individual answers because sometimes there's a certain personality it's like how do I do this with this relative and um, whatever the case may be questions about you know, healthy relationships, questions about average child experiences, questions about internet and body safety, we want to be there for you. Yeah, my, absolutely. My favorite is um, just picking back on Allison talking about calling. Um, the favorite way that I like to describe calls to JWRC are, I'm not sure if this is the right place to call, but I just have this question <laughs> and it's always the right place. Yes, yes, we are always, always on your team for any of those questions and answers. Well, thank you so much, everybody, Jane, Allison, and Kaylee. Um, and to you who are watching, we hope you enjoyed watching it, and we hope it helped answer some of your more frequently asked questions for our organization. Like Allison was saying, if you ever do have another question for us or are interested in any of the training opportunities we have, um, you can direct message us on Facebook. We can do another one of these answer videos um, and you can find us on our website, jwrc.org and fill out the contact form and you'll hear from somebody very <laughs> shortly since we're all at our computers at this time. Um, so again, thank you so much for watching um, and we hope you have a great day. Stay well, stay safe, thinking about you all. Thank you. Thanks, bye.